at any given moment in any given life some are rising and some are falling some are growing spiritually and some are descending to doom the tragedy in the human race today is that most are in the wrong direction last Tuesday 23 minutes into its flight Southwest Airlines 1380 began an uncontrolled descent. An engine exploded after liftoff from New York. The engine explosion killed the passenger immediately as the debris went through the cabin wall and depressurized. It's the reverse of what you see in movies. In movies, it's always don't shoot the gun in the cabin, it'll blow a hole through. The debris came into the cabin, depressurized it, and they began their descent. You don't normally descend 20,000 feet in six minutes. But as that captain worked to bring that plane down, all sorts of chaos ensued, masks came down, debris was filling the cabin, smoke. Many people live that way. Uh, they know their lives are out of control. They know in their heart of hearts that they are descending. They, they look back with nostalgia and they say, well, it was better 10 years ago or better 20 years ago. Their lives are descending spiritually, not ascending. But the good news is that God is the rescuer, both of people and planes, because sitting in the captain's seat was Timmy Joe Schultz, a born-again, baptized, believer really reformed, burned Baptist church in Texas, where she had led children's worship and taught Sunday school to all levels, children, youth, adults. And as she brought that plane down, she made a perfect landing. Not only that, but as the passengers were beginning to run out, she was down the aisle hugging people. The passengers report that she was hugging them, telling them how much she cared for them. She was indeed a rescuer. And then as she stepped off the plane, she sent one text to a fellow pilot and said, God is good. She risked her life bring those passengers out. And I want us to, as we, in this passage with Paul, and he's talking about how we get ourselves into trouble, I also want to remind us that the gospel is good and bad news. And so Paul's focus is the bad news here, our spiritual journey down. But the gospel does rescue us. So I'm going to add to this what has happened to you and I. So I'm going to tell our story using Paul as we look at descent from sin into sins. But then I'm also going to remind us that if you receive the gospel, you're beginning to ascend. You're rising. That the process that brings us to disaster gets reversed and brings us to glory. It's a slow process, so we can run it in reverse. And I'm going to do both as we look at descent from sin into sins. And I commend this passage to you. It is a difficult one. But there are truths in this passage that we're really struggling with today in Christianity. When somebody says, can someone be a, and a Christian, this passage, the entire passage, is an answer. Or when somebody says, well, can somebody make a profession of faith and then live like the devil and reach heaven, this passage answers that. Many of the questions that you and I have today about Christianity is, what is the problem or what are the symptoms? What is the disease and what develops right. And Paul is after this because he's going to say that the problem is a single sin that leads to sins. We, we often do the reverse. We say, I can't believe that person's A or does that. That's the problem. That's not the problem. That'd be like watching the plane on the runway and saying, I wonder why it's here. And so I want to show you this, beginning in verse 21, that Paul says, Spiritual independence is the problem. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations. Political independence is awesome. July 4th, 1776, Declaration of Independence is signed. Changed our country forever. Changed the world. Political independence is awesome. Spiritual independence is awful. And it always ends in disaster. And what has happened is, from our birth, we're born with a rebellious heart that looks at all God has made and all God 
God's will and we say, I will do it my own way. We embody the Frank Sinatra song, My Way. I'm going to do it my way, with my knowledge, with my standards. I, 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 and I've titled every point today with an I. <coughs> Independence declared. Paul says they knew God existed, but they wouldn't respond. The irony to me is that you destroy your life trying to be spiritually independent, but it doesn't really work. You, when you displace God, you replace Him with something. So it doesn't even work. You can't be spiritually independent. Paul will say later in Romans 6, you're either a slave of sin or you're a slave of God. And so let's look at this. In this, trying to work on this idea of what's gone wrong, I want to ask three questions. I want to say that this is really what comes, it comes down to with every person. Will people accept the knowledge of God? You got up this morning, the sun rose, you see the flowers, you see the blooming, the heavens declare the glory of God, the earth does too. God gives us knowledge as human beings. And the question God has is, having given you knowledge, what will you do? Will you accept it? Will you live like children? Will you live for God's glory? Again, I'm in this passage here, verse 21. Will you honor Him as God? Will you make the very difficult decision to say it's not all about me, despite what my parents said or my culture or movies, it's not all about me, it's all about God. And I'm going to live for Him. And then will people thank Him? You see, the root of sin is independence and it manifests itself. Will you accept the knowledge of God? Will you live for His glory? And will you thank Him? The other sins, the other 24 sins in this chapter, including the, the controversial one, coming up next week, homosexuality, are symptoms of getting this wrong. No one spends an eternity away from God because of sins. They were in trouble a long time before. And what Paul's saying is, the root issue is what you do with God. So I just want to show you this with Adam and Eve. Put in a beautiful garden, beyond compare. And God says to Adam and Eve, now I want you to stay like children. I don't want you to know good and evil. You can live here forever. Just trust me. And the serpent comes and says, would you like to be as wise as God? And our spiritual ancestors did exactly what you and I do. We say, no. And one of the reasons why they ate the fruit was to become as wise as God. They threw off God, and it brought death. God put them there and said, tend the earth for my glory. Do all of this for me. And the serpent came and said, wouldn't you like to make a name for yourself? Long before the American dream came along, wouldn't you like to be great? You too can be great like God. Just steal some of His glory. And Adam and Eve did. And you and I were born that way. We're glory grabbers. You don't teach a young child to accumulate everything. You never teach a teenager that it's all about them. You never teach an adult to hoard possessions and relationships and praise. We all know glory grabbers. We all know people that jump in the spotlight, claim credit whether they deserve it or not. They live for approval. Adam and Eve would not. And God's judgment fell upon them. And ironically, the way God deals with it is He takes from them knowledge. They once had a direct knowledge of God. And then it's clouded. He takes from them glory. He drives them out of the garden. He takes from them the reason to be grateful now the earth was separated from them. And then he sends his son Jesus. And this is the good news for us in the middle of a dark chapter. The father says to the son, son, go. And when you go to the earth, only speak my words. Only walk my way. And only do my will. And the son said, I will. Jesus said, I don't speak a single word the father hasn't given me. Even on a terrible night in the garden, Father, if there's any other way, let the cup pass from me. Not my will, but yours be done. Our Savior earns our salvation by spiritual dependence. He did right what you and I did wrong. 
He lived for the glory of God. And he was a thankful man. He completely received that. That's why God says, my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Now, I need a couple terms here for this chapter and the next chapter. So I'm going to give you these terms. I'm going to tell you the way I'm using them. I want to talk about unrepentant sinners here. And here, I, I'm not thinking of your neighbor or your family member that might get saved. I'm thinking about the person that will go to their grave without repentance. There's still hope. Okay, our family, our friends, our neighbors, pray for them. I'm, I'm talking about the person that their obituary is published. It's all over. They have the funeral. There's no going back. And they've never bowed the knees to Jesus. And they just live their life spiritually however they want it. They have not accepted God's knowledge, lived for His glory and truthfulness. And Paul says in verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed. The reason why you and I do evangelism, the reason why you and I invite is because our family, our friends are already under the wrath of God. God is already intensely angry at their sin and He's already beginning to make them pay. And it's going to get much worse. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed. Why? Because of spiritual independence. <clears throat> then what about you and I? What about repentant saints? What happens when you and I have done all these things wrong since childhood and we, we come to the gospel? See, this is the, the rescue. And so I'm going to use repentant saints for us when we're walking with the Lord. And here, we're growing. We're growing. We, we don't have a complete... You're not saved because you get it always right. We don't always bow to His knowledge. God says, do this, don't do that. We struggle with it a little bit. But, but generally, you and I are on an upward path. And we're learning to say yes. And God responds with joy and blessings. And, and I had to do the little legal asterisk here. Because you may not receive His blessings as blessings. Sometimes God's blessing is a sickness. Sometimes it's the law. So when I say God's joy blessings, I don't mean pie in the sky, Pollyanna, come to Jesus, and it's all going to be great. But God will give you joy, and He will give you blessings because you are a repentant saint. You are not in this category. So one of the things I have to do for you is I have to say, I know you're not in the category of an unrepentant sinner, but everybody else you know is. And you once were. This is the biography of your life. If you were saved at 5 or 15 or 35, this is who you were and what you did. And you need to know how you were born. Because one of my fears is that we, for many who have been Christians so many years, somebody says, how do I go to heaven? And we say, hmm. well, I know I'm going. And I remember a pastor talked to me one time. But I have no earthly idea how you do it. Just, just... I don't know. Come to church. And we don't know the gospel because we don't know who we were. And so that's why Paul does this. He's, he's writing to Christians in Rome and saying, before I arrive, I want you to know your family history. And then what about us on our bad days when we're relapsing? What about the days where, where we're, we're sort of following the Lord? We're still saints. We don't need a council to declare us a saint. But I'm talking about that day where God says, you may not do that. We say, oh, it's costly. Or God says, you know, I'm not going to give you that promotion. I'm not going to give you that job. I'm not going to give it to you. Because I'm sovereign. I'm God. You don't get it. I'm going to give it to your nemesis. I'm going to give it to your coworker who hates you. I'm going to prosper the wicked. I'm not going to honor you like that. And we get frustrated about it. Or God sends something terrible in our life and we struggle to be thankful. And the good news is that God holds on to us, but here's what He does. He disciplines us. He disciplines us. Love it. Just like your parents probably did. He comes along and He says, keep going. Keep going. The Christian life is a journey. There's not one of us that perfectly accepts the knowledge of God He gives us in creation or in the Bible, or we'd be perfect, right? I mean, every time I sin, I say to God, I know better. 
Every time I do something selfish, I, I get back into the American dream. It's all about me. Follow my heart. I follow my heart, and God says, what kind of fool are you? Are you the same in the universe? Or I grumble, or I complain, or I don't like something. So I, I know that today you're repenting, growing saint, or, or you're struggling. And, and it may have changed from yesterday to today. You may be sailing along doing great in the middle of the week. I know this changes. Romans is for you. Romans chapter 7, Paul's going to say, what I want to do, I don't do. And everything I don't want to do, I do. Romans is a battle plan. That as you and I dig into the gospel, we're going to get the weapons to live for the Lord. And so already this morning, stuff, God has spoken to some of you, and you realize that you're relapsing. You're going back the wrong way. Here's what happens. Independence is followed in the second part of that verse by ignorance. Independence is followed by ignorance. They became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. Paul says it three times. Lights out. No eyesight to see things correctly. Dark heart. And it leads to futile living. When somebody looks at the glory of God and says, I will not accept it, the mind is shot. They were cool for the eclipse, but wouldn't you be worried about your neighbor? If they went around all the time with the eclipse glasses still on. And they're like, I just love my life and I see things so clearly. That's what Paul says. Ignorance is a result of sin. When you watch the news and they say something and you think to yourself, how in the world do they think that? The mental issue comes from a heart that's declared independent. As soon as you say to God, I will not have a proper relationship with you, your mind is gone. And the values and the ethics you live by, you don't get it right. You, you don't get it right. Everything's gone. The heart's gone. The mind's gone. As soon as somebody looks at the sun and says, I don't believe in it, everything goes dark. And what's worse is notice that it's not just that they're blind, it's that they're happy about it. Imagine you're, you're telling a story when you're like, well, you know, I did this thing last night. I, I was walking through the house in the dark. I know I should have flipped on the light and then smacked right into the wall. Aren't I smart? You see, we have the audacity human beings. We say there is no God. We're like the fool in Psalm 14. Either we don't believe in Him or we don't acknowledge Him. And then we say, look at how smart we are. I hear it all the time. In the news, and science, and politics, we are so smart, we're going to solve all the problems in the world. Just look at humanity. We are awesome. We are horrible. We kill each other, we harm each other, we're destroying the world, and we say how smart we are. Is there a God around here? You see, professing to be wise, they become fools. Unrepentant sinners, they have to replace the truth with something. That's what Paul's saying here. Paul's saying, if you deny the truth God gives you, you have, to, you have to have something. Everybody has a standard. Everybody lives by something. What you got from your family, you made it up, you learned in college. Everybody has a moral code. Everybody has a standard. They just may not know what it is. Without supernatural light, their minds malfunction. And they manufacture false and fatal ideas. That's what Paul says. If you declare independence from God, as we all did from birth, you're ignorant. And unfortunately, ignorance is not innocence. I think this will help you and I with unbelievers. We get so frustrated with unbelievers. We get so frustrated with people around us. And we're just, why? Why can't they not see it? Why did he act that way? It's because they can't do different. They're ignorant. Paul says when he was killing Christians, he was ignorant. Jesus prays from the cross, Father, forgive them. They know what they do. Lights out, but it gets worse. See, we've got this descent pattern here. The explosion is, I will not have a relationship with God. Ignorance comes. And then when you and I repent, 
God begins to fill us back up with light. When we've accepted the truth of the gospel, God renews our minds. He sets us free to think rightly. Your, your brain comes on. For God who said, light shines out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to show the light of the glory of God. 2 Corinthians. The God who created the sun turns the light back on. And you and I can see the world in a way that no one else can. You and I have right functioning minds and we are the only ones as believers that can see the world in really ways. The only ones. And listen, that's not a source of pride. That's grace. Paul went around thinking that killing Christians was a great idea. And unbelievers get up every day and they say, well, I've got a great life and I'm going to do great things. Paul says, and then when we get saved, God begins to say to you, my child, Here's my view of that. My child, here's the right view of politics. Here's the right view of that social issue. Here's the right view of family. Here's the right view of marriage. As you and I are growing, our views should change. You should have different views than what you were raised with. Unless you were raised by really amazing Christians. We get free. And Paul's going to talk about that in Romans. Ignorance leads to idolatry. It's just a bad cycle here. Verse 23 and verse 25. They exchanged the glory of God, the glory of the incorruptible God, for an image and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. We make a horrible swap. We as humans are irrepressible worshipers. Everybody worships something. The atheist worships something. The agnostic worships something. Everybody worships. That's unique to human beings. Your pet may love you, but they don't worship you. Animals don't worship. We worship. And so when somebody says, I'm going to reject the relationship with God, it's obvious to me. They replace it with something. And the irony is that most people you talk to don't know what their idol is. Most people don't know who they serve, what they serve, but they do. And this thing's going to help you and I because as you and I talk to people and they're clinging to idols, they're clinging to their gods and not the true God, you and I need to help them with that. Sometimes the most loving thing you can do to your friend or family neighbor is say, you know, you seem awfully obsessed with money. You seem awfully obsessed with... The, you, you seem to bend your life around this. I'm concerned for you. The way I got saved at 19 is instead of telling me what a good person I was because I went to church, I had a pastor who to know me well enough that he pointed out the idols in my life. I was shocked. I'd never had anybody speak to me that way. Shocked. He just took me apart one afternoon. He said, I just have to tell you that you're not a Christian because this is your life. And he just described my life in a way I had never heard before. And instead of patting me on the back and saying, I'm glad you were a good seeker and you're here at church. I'm glad you were baptized nine years ago. He said, you're not going to heaven. Because I can show you your gods. We always replace it with something. In the ancient world that Paul's talking about is all the animals, images of animals, I jotted down that they used to worship pigs and snakes and tigers and elephants and monkeys and wolves and dogs and goats and horses. Now, I want you to feel how foolish this is because I'm getting ready to get to our idols. Okay, so, so this is where they, this is where you say, how stupid to worship a creature rather than the creator. And I wish I could tell you this was gone, but in most of the world, it's not developed. The worship of creatures continues. Hindus still review rear cows is holy. This is not gone. But in our modern world, you're not going to expect your neighbor to have like a golden calf on the table. Be worried if they came in and they said, would you, would you kind of bow in courtesy to the household idol? But they do have idols. The good life. By that I mean health and wealth. You and I know people. You say, what are you living for? I, I, I want to be healthy and I want to have money. You're supposed to live for the glory of God, the fame of His name. There are people you and I know perishing because they're after the good life. The good life is fine if God gives it, but that's the idol. 
every advertisement, every movie, every ad campaign. This is the good life. This is what you need. If you just had this, you'd have the good life. And to live for the good life and not for God is the path to destruction. The, the good family, this is so insidious. God gave us children, He gave us spouses, and people hold them up as idols. Who do you live for? My family? Be careful. You can live for your family for the glory of God, or you can just live for your family. It's very subtle, isn't it? But there are lots of people out there. Sunday's my day, it's my family day. I'm the family. We got stuff to do. Well, we don't really have time for that. I am the family. I am the family. That's idolatry. It's idolatry. Good education, good job, good entertainment, good religion. I, the, the good religion just amazes me. I, I just, I, I cannot, I cannot grasp this. Unbelievers go to church and have fun doing it. If I was an unbeliever, I would not be in church. But there are people you and I know who get dressed up on Sunday morning and they go to church that doesn't teach the gospel where nobody's saved, including the pastor. And they like it. And they live for their church, but they don't live for Jesus. <clears throat> and then what does God do when he saves us? We start dying for this stuff. Jesus, if anyone wishes to come after me, let him take up his cross and fall after me. God says, now, I see the idol of your life, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad you got saved, right? Faith and repentance. And God starts knocking off his rivals. You don't have to be idle free to be saved. You just have to be repentant. And God begins to pry your fingers off of things. Well, the job is important, but not as important as Jesus. And your family's important, but not as important as Jesus. We die out. That's gross. That's how we grow. You, you see it when people come and pray here. They're letting go of something. We grow as we let go. God pries our fingers off of things. And I guarantee you, whether you know it or not, God's prying your fingers off something. Your health is too important to you or, or something. As you grow, there's things that God is saying, my child, let go. My child, let go. My child, let go. And you grow as you let go. We have to have open hands. Lord, when I came to you in faith, I gave you everything. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's why we have Job. The book of Job is to show us what you and I do when God says, you know all the blessings I gave you? They're gone. And you and I worship with open hands. And then the fourth step, and I'm just going to introduce this because Paul goes deeper into this. Independence leads to ignorance, leads to idolatry, leads to immorality. And I have to tell you that this is just frightening. God says, I see. I see. You won't live for me. Good luck. Have a nice life. And we'll see what leads you God turns people over. He sets them free. Verse 24. Therefore God gave them over. Hands them over. The lust of their hearts to impurity. That their bodies might be dishonored among them. God says, you know, you really love that? Have fun. He releases us. You see, we've got this view as human beings that we're in charge. That, we, that we've got it all down. There's a poem off the read at graduations. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. That is not true. We're, we're buffeted around. We're blown around by our desires. There's not one of us not capable of breaking every one of the Ten Commandments. I've never met a person not capable of murder. I've never met a person not capable of adultery. I've never met a person not capable of blasphemy. And even when you become a Christian, it's still possible. And God says, my punishment is that if you want to make a fool out of yourself, go for it. Because our God will not be dishonored. He will be honored by saving, or he'll be honored by letting us destroy ourselves. And that's what Paul's going to say here. Three times, verse 24, he gave them over. Verse 25, 
Verse 26, he gave them over. Verse 28, God gave them over. You see, the sins aren't the problem. They're the symptom. You go to the doctor, you say, I got this headache. And the doctor says, well, it's the brain tumor I've been talking about. You're like, well, can you just give me a stronger painkiller? It's the tumor. Unrepentant sins, God turns them over to evil desires. Short-term pleasure. I, listen, it, your life may have seemed more fun before you got saved. So throw them in it. I mean, you can, you can binge watch videos and you can drink yourself. And, I mean, you, there's lots of things you can do that you're... I mean, you can really get into short-term pleasures. And most people you know are seeking short-term pleasures. And God says, if you will not accept my gospel, if you will not accept my son, go for it. Now, the good news is that God often rescues us, right? We get tired. We get tired. People come into church, they're tired. They, they, they get sick. They get, they, something shakes off that children are born. They get tired of just short-term pleasures. They're looking for something. God saves them. Because it leads to long-term pain. That's God's grace. And somebody says, I, I hate my life. I hate the way I'm living. That's grace. That's the first step to salvation. I don't want my life anymore. And eventually eternal wrath. And I just want to show you again. I don't want to push too far here. But I want to show you that what Paul's going to say is that it leads us to live in unnatural ways. And here I stand on the Word of God and we stand in total opposition to our culture. To even say the word unnatural is debated today. You say, that's unnatural, and people are like, well, what's nature? Nature is what you make it to be. You can be anything you want to be at any time. It's however you're feeling. Paul's going to say it's unnatural. And he's going to show it to us. That we take good things and we twist them in. And what's interesting about human beings is that before you got saved, what you twisted was different than what I twisted. You see, to say that we're all sinners doesn't mean we all sin the same way. My sin of choice before I got saved wasn't gambling. I can't comprehend gambling. I look at it, I'm like, I don't understand it. But I know people addicted to it. And they're drawn to it. God released them to their desires. And they're as addicted to gambling as you are to whatever it is before you got saved. And what Paul's going to do the rest of the chapter, which we're going to graciously and mercifully only handle in one more week, Paul's going to list 24 sins. And parents, be aware, I do address the issue of homosexuality next week. I will not be any more graphic than Paul. And we need to deal with that because Paul's number one exhibit of unnatural behavior is homosexuality. Verse 26 and 27. And you and I need to feel that. And then we need to beat feet to see the other ones. Because it's not just homosexuality, it's unnatural. Paul's going to say that we mess up anger. Just glance, glance down the page here. Verse 29, I'm looking at the latter part. Full of envy and murder. Paul's going to say, because you don't have a relationship with God, your anger gets out of control. It's unnatural. You kill people. Language, verse 30. Boastful slanderers. That's why when you and I say all sins are equal, there's a partial truth to that. The gossip of the town is on the same path as the chronic adulterer. They go the same place. Any chronic sin, any sin that just goes on and on and on, unrepentant, any sin shows you're not a believer. How about human creativity? Verse 30. Inventors of evil. I won't name it, but I've discovered a sin in Andrea's presentation on Friday night. I didn't even know there was a type of sin she mentioned. Just shocked. Pastors think they know a catalog of sins that I discovered. It's like, really? We're that creative? God made us in His image to rule the world and we're that evil? We take God's good creativity and we twist it. Until God saves us. And authority, verse 30. Children, teenagers, parents. Disobedient to parents makes the list. The disobedient 10 year old is showing that they're not saved. And it's chronic, again, it's not one day. 
The disobedient child, age 10, is showing the same defiance of God as all the other sins there. So we're going to look at that next week. We're going to see that God says, I've given you warning lights. I've given you signs. When you see that your life's out of control, when you see that your mouth is out of control, when you see that your feet run the wild, when you see all these things, if you're a Christian and they bother you, you're okay. God is you up. But people who fold their arms and say, I'm just fine. Paul says you're not. And you and I were all on that path before God saved us. You see, we got it backwards in the Christian world. When somebody says, can you be a Christian? And no, that's the wrong question. The question is, what kind of a person lives in that? What kind of a person lives in gossip? What kind of person lives twisting arts evil? What kind of person slanders? What kind of person is greedy? People that don't have a relationship with the Lord. So here's some thoughts. And again, we'll come back to this next week. This whole idea of sins as symptoms. Repentant sins battle back. We're battling back, aren't we? I don't know how many years you've been saved, but you're battling back. You are climbing out of this pit. And I need to say that some of you need to be saved today. You know what they do when they get on a plane, right? They always do the, the seat belts and stuff. And what do they always tell you? If the mass descends, you put it over your mouth and your nose. And the passengers on that plane messed it up. There's lots of pictures from that flight. And having heard it a hundred times as business travelers, you stand up there and you say, your life depends upon putting it over your nose. And when the debris was blowing around, one of the men said, having to use the oxygen mask for the first time amid all the chaos and turbulence, and the fact there was a huge hole inside the plane would have made it very difficult. People get on the plane, and they just blow off the warning. Ever check to see if there's a cushion under your seat? Maybe they're lying. Ever check the exit? No, we don't. You get on a plane and they say, your life may depend upon the very words we're getting ready to say, and people are like shuffling the books. And your life depends on receiving the gospel. And I fear greatly as we work through Romans that, that there are some who have not received the gospel. You've heard it, you've heard it, you've heard it, and you know. And you will remember this day, you will remember this sermon, you will remember this text for eternity, and you'll think, why? Why did I not do that? <clears throat> so I offer that to you today. Make sure that you are a repentant saint and not an unrepentant sinner. Because you don't know tomorrow. Be saved today. When we grow in the knowledge of God, God gives us wisdom. I know there's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. But here's what God does. As you and I grow in our knowledge of Him, He makes us wise. Coming to Sunday school makes you wise. Listening to sermons makes you wise. Reading your Bible every week makes you wise. As you say, God, I just want to know you. He gives you wisdom. You can't create wisdom. And I know people say, well, the Bible doesn't give me wisdom. No, God gives you wisdom as you seek Him. Make sure that you're deeply in His Word, personally and privately. When a Christian doesn't open their Bible, when a Christian doesn't study it, when they look at it, you're saying to God, I got enough. Thank you. I got my second grade spiritual education and I'm doing fine. Make sure, because God will give you wisdom as you climb out of that hole. When we grow in thankfulness, God gives us contentment. One of the greatest gifts He gives us is contentment. We can say, Pastor, I'm, I'm okay in life. I don't have everything I would have wanted, but I'm content. I'm like Paul in prison. It's a good life. I was looking for the good life, and now I realize that I'm content. God will give that to you as you thank Him. As you begin your prayers with thankfulness, as you, as you write down your blessings. You see, as we practice thankfulness, God says, Ah, I'll give you. And often He'll give you what you need. If God gave you what you were asking for before you were content, He would be hands you an idol. If God gave you what's on your prayer list before you found contentment in Him, He would be causing you to sin. 
God will only give good gifts to His children. And that thing that you've been praying for, Lord, would you just... He's not doing it because it caused you a problem. Because if it wasn't, He'd give it to you. Every good gift you can currently handle is given. And when you get ready to receive the next one, He'll give it to you. When we grow and put in God's glory above ours, He lifts us out of our sinful cap captivity and bent sins. I'm going to talk about this next week. I'm going to say as Christians, they're just particular sins that beset us. Your private sin battle is not mine. And I'm also convinced you can't win it. It's not by grace I've been saved, and now by my amazing power I beat down sins. I'm a Christian gladiator. You can't beat that sin. You can't beat that gossip. You can't beat that slander. You can't beat that anger. But as you seek God, seek first His kingdom and all His glory, He'll take care of that sin. He'll look up in six months and say, it's the weirdest thing. Where did that go? We have books, we have conferences, we have seminars. They're all like, beat this sin. Here's ten tips. It will never work. I know lots of men who struggle with pornography. I've never seen victory until they got into the Bible. And as they meditate and memorize, it goes away. You'll never beat that sin until you go deeper into God's glory. We live for God in areas of our life. He protects us from idolatry, exhaustion, and futility. Again, same idea. Seek first God. Receive His knowledge. Live for His glory. He'll take the sins out of your life. And then share. Share. Because that person you think will never repent, that, that neighbor, that friend, that, that person that you're worried about can and will. This is a letter signed by the Apostle Paul. You couldn't have been further gone than Paul. Paul writes this, he's thinking, oh, that's me. Mm -hmm. That's me. That was me. The only thing that will set them free is the gospel. And so you and I, as we go through Romans, we commit to share in the gospel as God gives us to us. Hear then the word of the Lord before we pray. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of God for an image in the form of corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and crowned creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts and purity, that their bodies might be dishonored. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. Worship the creation of the Creator. He's blessed forever.